Hello, everyone. Welcome to our NBF GNEM Symposium Speaker Series. Uh, for those of you I haven't had the pleasure of meeting, I am Lale Welsh, the CEO at NDF. With me, I have Dr. Nuria Carrillo, who is our Chief Medical Officer at NDF. Um, and of course, today we're going to be speaking with Dr. Paul Martin, a favorite around here. Uh, Paul Martin, PhD, is a principal investigator in the Center for Gene Therapy at the Research Institute at Nationwide Children's. Um, he's also a professor of pediatrics and professor of physiology and cell biology at the Ohio State University College of Medicine. He's a very impressive man. He's also associate director of the NIH Center of Research Transit Translation in Muscular Dystrophy Therapeutic Development at Nationwide Children's Hospital. And it's interesting that Dr. Martin's lab has identified particular carbohydrates that when overexpressed in muscle cells can prevent muscular dystrophy from occurring in a number of forms of the disease. So maybe at the end of this, you'll have an opportunity to get him to talk about that because that's very exciting. Um, and um, today what we're gonna learn from Dr. Martin in our limited time with him is we're gonna get a little background on gene therapy, which I think is important because we always talk about the future of it, but I think the background on how it works is critical. And we're gonna learn about potency assays uh, in order to optimize gene therapy. Uh, both in vivo and in vitro. And I know that we're also gonna learn about some new technologies. Our patient uh, base is very educated, Dr. Martin. However, there's those of us who can't follow as well. So perhaps um, you can prepare yourself for Q&A at the end. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Martin. Nuria and I will be back at the end for Q&A. Great. Well, thank you so much, Lale, for the invitation, and it's my great pleasure to speak with you today. Uh, as Lale mentioned, I, uh, my lab has been working on understanding the function of carbohydrates in muscle and how to manipulate them for therapeutic purposes for a number of years, and I have um, uh, always been interested in GNE myopathy ever since uh, Stella Matrani Rosenbaum and her colleagues discovered that the GNE gene uh, mutations were the cause of this disease. I've been following this uh, field, uh, and uh, uh, in the past few years, we have um, actually started to work on this disease uh, with the hope of developing uh, gene therapies to treat it. Um, so I'm going to share with you a little bit about all of that today. Let's see if I can move um, my screen here. There it is. Um, so uh, we have just received a grant from the NDF. It's our first one uh, in June of 2020 uh, to perform some experiments on GNE gene therapy, and we're obviously very grateful for that. Um, uh, and I will share with you some of the very early work uh, that we have done there, but obviously um, that work is just getting going, so it's not going to be um, uh, complete yet. And uh, as Lale said, uh, I'm going to um, begin by talking about the basics of gene therapy because it, it, it's, uh, you know, a lot of people um, get very excited about the concept of gene therapy, but, but, but aren't given enough information about actually how we get it to work. Um, and I think that's important to do. I'll talk a little bit about some successes, uh, recent successes here at Nationwide Children's in treating other diseases with gene therapy. Uh, so, um, and the incredible potential to develop it uh, for GNE myopathy. And then we'll talk a little bit about the potency assays and I'll finish by talking about um, what I like to call second generation gene therapy is where we actually express more than one gene at a time so that we can get more than one thing to happen in the therapy. Um, and so uh, you know, this, this fits, I think, well into uh, the scientific mission of NDF because uh, our goal here ultimately is to help develop uh, therapeutics for patients. Uh, 
just my disclosures are here. Uh, so I receive uh, licensing fees from Sarepta Therapeutics for um, a gene therapy that we currently have in clinical trials, phase one clinical trials for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. I'm on the scientific board of Prothelia, and I also have started a gene therapy company called Genesera, uh, along uh, with Gidon Eckler. Uh, so this is basically all that gene therapy is. These little tiny particles here are uh, the capsid protein from adeno-associated virus, or AAV. And uh, what we do is to put a piece of DNA within that capsid. It's a watertight 20 nanometer nanoparticle uh, that normally would infect a human tissue. Uh, but instead of putting the virus genome into the tissue, we've removed that. And now we can put a therapeutic gene in instead. Um, so this little dark thing here shows you a piece of DNA packaged into one of those viral capsids. And obviously this one over here doesn't have DNA in it. And so uh, here at Children's, we have a number of protocols to purify these uh, packaged materials away from the unpackaged materials. And when you do that and you run a gel, uh, you get a, a gel like this where there are only three proteins. So these three proteins are basically what make up this little sphere of, of virus. Uh, and uh, they uh, occur in a 10 to 1 to 1 ratio. And, uh, and that is what we're injecting into the patient. Uh, so one of the things that's really uh, a luxury about working at Nationwide Children's is that we have our own manufacturing facilities here to make uh, AAV gene therapy products, including clinical grade gene therapy. So we make our own uh, virus to inject into patients. Uh, and because of that, we actually, when we're doing research on uh, those viruses, um, we use the exact same manufacturing protocol to put uh, test uh, gene therapies in animals and in cells that we use to put into patients. So um, one of the things the FDA always wants to see when they're looking for proof that, that a gene therapy works is that you're actually making it the same way you would make it when you're going to give it to a person. And we've sort of solved that problem here at Nationwide Children's by having our own manufacturing facility. Um, so as I said before, the, uh, uh, the viral genome of AAV is only two genes. It's called, a gene called rep here in yellow and a gene called cap in green. And what we do is to remove those from the genome and leave only behind these two little small pieces uh, that are red here at the top. And those are called ITRs or inverted terminal repeats. And those two pieces of DNA are what are gonna stick that DNA into the inside of the capsid protein. So that's how the DNA gets to be packaged. Uh, and then the rest of, of what we put in there is uh, all a therapeutic gene. So that therapeutic gene will have a promoter that drives the expression of that gene only in the cells that we want it expressed in in the tissue. Usually we have an intervening sequence and this would be an intron of some sort to stabilize the transcript once the gene is read. And then we have the therapeutic transgene, a polyadenylation sequence which uh, increases the stability of the mRNA once it's made. Uh, so that is put into a plasmid the viral genome is put into a second plasmid, and then these genes from adenovirus are put into a third plasmid, uh, and then all three of those are transfected into a human cell, like an HEK293 cell, and out comes the virus. So we put these genes in because um, adeno-associated virus, as its name implies, can't replicate at all unless it's has a co-infection with adenovirus. So a second virus has to infect the cell in order for uh, AAV to replicate. And we add the genes that are involved in that process back along with uh, uh, in a second and a third plasmid to make the virus. Uh, so AAV by itself, as I said, can infect humans, uh, uh, but it is not, uh, does not cause any disease. Um, so it's an incredibly safe uh, virus capsid to use uh, to deliver uh, transgenes to patients. 
So once you have your uh, foreign gene or your therapeutic gene packaged into the viral capsid, uh, you inject it usually into the blood intravenously, although there are different ways to do this. Uh, you can inject it directly into a tissue or um, uh, into the arterial blood flow. And, and it uh, has an amazing capacity then to uh, bind to cells within tissues and deliver that gene into the nucleus where it needs to be uh, to be read. And so when AAV does this, it delivers that gene to the nucleus in a way that it doesn't integrate into your genome. So when a lot of people, when they think of gene therapy, they think of, oh, you're going to correct my gene in my own cells. And there are certainly technologies to do that, but this is a very different process where we're just going to put a normal or, or unmutated version of the gene uh, back into the nucleus uh, to fix the, the problem, and uh, that is done in a way that doesn't interfere with the rest of the genome that's there. There are um, a few caveats to that, but that's a lecture for another day. So the serotype that we use of AAV to uh, deliver our genes is called RHESUS 74 or RH74. Uh, that was discovered, this is a serotype that was discovered in a rhesus macaque here at Nationwide Children's Hospital. And it has an amazing ability to travel from the blood into tissues and deliver genes, uh, particularly to muscle. Uh, so uh, this is just a couple of examples of targeting particular muscle groups here in the mouse where we've cannulated the femoral artery and vein of the leg. And you can see green fluorescent protein as a reporter protein which spontaneously fluoresces, uh, targeting the lower limb here. Uh, likewise, in a, in a non-human primate, we can target specific muscles, in this case, the gastrocnemius, by delivering the gene specifically via the sural artery. And when you take that muscle out, you can see it's, it's green even to the naked eye, but if you cut through sections of it, you can see that most of the cells have the gene within them. And so there are a number of serotypes like this, uh, AAV9 and 8 are often used as well, uh, that can do this trick of getting out of the blood and getting into tissues so that genes can be delivered uh, to places in the body where you need them. And so this is just one example of how, um, uh, how we've done that for um, our GALGT2 study. Uh, and this is from a toxicology uh, study that we did uh, for that work. And we've taken every uh, organ out of, of the animal after we've injected it, the, the, the gene intravenously, and um, measured how many pieces of DNA are in each tissue. Um, and so just as a rule here, if you have this many genomes, uh, this many copies, per microgram of genomic DNA, that's about one vector genome per nucleus. So what that means is that on average, every nucleus in that tissue got one copy of the gene. Uh, and so that's exactly what you want to have happen if you want to replace a, a mutated gene function uh, in a muscle. Uh, you want it to be in every place in that muscle uh, that it needs to function. Uh, and so, you know, this shows that in the heart and the diaphragm, which is your muscle for breathing, and the triceps, which is one of your arm muscles, quadriceps and gastrocnemius, and your leg muscles, you can get between four and 10 copies of the, of the foreign gene into every nucleus of those muscle tissues at this particular dose. Now, you actually get the, the, the gene therapy into every tissue of the body. Uh, the brain is less well transduced because of the blood-brain barrier, uh, but the spinal cord, the lung, the stomach, the intestine, the liver, the liver is particularly well transduced because it takes up viruses to clear them out of the blood. Uh, all of these organs are gonna get copies of this, of this gene. So if you want it only to be expressed in muscle, you have to use a muscle-specific promoter to do that. If you want it to be expressed everywhere, you can do that. Uh, so that's, that's sort of how this works. Um, so 
there are over 60 clinical trials going on right now using AAV. Almost all of those have shown incredible safety, and uh, some of them have shown incredible efficacy. So um, Luxterna was the first gene therapy approved uh, from Spark Therapeutics. Uh, the, the RPE65 gene is, is uh, put into the eye by direct retinal injection, uh, and uh, you can actually reverse blindness in, in this disease, Leber's congenital amaurosis. So really profound change in the function of, of the eye. Uh, likewise, uh, for hemophilias, uh, factor eight and nine can be injected into the liver and then secreted into the blood, uh, and these can have profound effects on stopping of, of bleeding, dis, uh, episodes of bleeding in patients with hemophilia. Uh, perhaps the most striking clinical trial um, for gene therapy was done here at Children's Hospital, which was SMN gene therapy for spinal muscular atrophy type 1. This is also now called Zolgensma, which has been approved by the FDA for treatment in this disease. And um, children with, with SMA1 uh, show profound, uh, uh, this is a motor neuron disease, so they show profound muscle weakness and um, uh, very early um, death, and, and all of those uh, phenotypes are reversed by the gene therapy treatment. And in several instances, uh, kids are even walking with this gene therapy treatment, um, which is never something that's seen uh, with this disease. Other muscle diseases where gene therapy has been really uh, had a profound effect uh, include my excellent myotubular myopathy. I'm going to talk about that a little bit on the next slide. Uh, and uh, also done at children's uh, microdystrophin gene therapy uh, for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. This was done by Dr. Jerry Mandel, and his clinical trial was just recently published out to a year. Uh, and uh, all of the subjects that were treated with microdystrophin, uh, so Duchenne is a, a deficiency in dystrophin gene. Uh, showed improvements in their motor function and their muscle function uh, at a year out from treatment. And we have a number of trials going on right now in the center, uh, primarily on muscle, muscle and muscular dystrophy diseases and uh, neurological diseases. Uh, there's one uh, little caveat I want to point out here. Uh, so last year when I went to the Society for Gene Therapy meeting, the probably one of the most exciting talks I heard was about uh, myotubularin gene therapy for myotubular myopathy, which is a, a, a severe disease of childhood, uh, where uh, at this lower dose of 1 times 10 to the 14th, uh, uh, they had shown uh, very significant improvements in, in uh, patient function. So crawling, the ability to not have a, need a respirator, uh, a number of major improvements in clinical findings. Uh, just a year later now, uh, that trial has been halted because when they went to uh, three times that dose for the higher dose in the, in the trial, uh, several patients died. Uh, uh, and while that may have uh, a lot to do with that disease in particular and liver dysfunction that, in that disease. It just is a real eye-opener uh, for the FDA and, and for anybody that's developing clinical gene therapies to remind you that um, the safety uh, window is, is a really important thing to consider when you're developing a gene therapy product uh, because increasing dose, even by modest amounts, uh, can lead to very different outcomes. Uh, and so what you really want is uh, to develop up front the gene therapy to be as potent as it can be so that you can inject the smallest amount of virus that you need to get the largest amount of clinical benefit, which is what potency assays uh, can do for you. So um, as yet, there's no gene therapy for g and &E myopathy that, that has been approved. Um, and actually, no FDA therapy is approved that change outcome in this in this disease yet. Uh, there, uh, as you I'm sure all know, have been some glycan therapies that have been tried 
slow release sialic acid in this phase three trial by Ultragenics, which showed no clinical benefit in the original in the in the phase three study. And then there's also um, MANDAC trials that are going on in phase two studies by Ledian. Uh, but our our goal here is to develop gene therapy, which we think is uh, a logical uh, and reasonable approach for this disease. Uh, and it has the advantage of being what we call sort of a one and done therapy. You inject gene therapy only once. Uh, it goes into all of the cells that you want it to go into. Then um, that gene remains for many years and perhaps for a lifetime uh, without the need for redosing. Uh, so these recent gene therapy failures have really shined a light on the importance of optimizing uh, uh, gene therapy uh, before you get to clinical trials. Uh, and the big questions we're sort of interested in and that I'll address today are what organs is expression needed in for GNE myopathy? And um, have the promoters, the DNA sequences, uh, been optimized to achieve uh, that organ expression uh, at the lowest possible AAV dose. Uh, so to do answer either or, or both of these questions, you need to develop both cell-based assays for potency and also um, animal-based assays for potency. So GE, uh, the g and &E gene is, of course, mutations in the g and &E gene are what cause g and &E myopathy. Uh, these can lead to reduced enzymatic, enzymatic activity, which reduces the amount of salic acid that's made. And so g and &E has these two important steps here in the biosynthetic pathway for salic acid, where UDP GlucNAC is a primerized to MANNAC, and subsequently uh, the gene has a second function, which is to phosphorylate that MANNAC, which then uh, leads to ultimately to the synthesis of CMP sialic acid. CMP sialic acid then is used by the Tonier or so salyl transferases in the Golgi to put sialic acid onto proteins and lipids. So to do a cell-based assay, we have taken advantage of the LEC3 cell line. This is a cell line that was originally made by Pamela Stanley, who is a professor at Albert Einstein University in New York. Uh, and she was uh, kind enough to share these cells with us. They contain uh, a mutation in the g and &E gene that leads to an inability of these cells to make sialic acid. So much like uh, patients with the disease, these LEC3 cells uh, cannot make a, a sialic acid. Um, so uh, what we're doing here is staining with MAA, which is a lectin that recognizes sialic acid. We're staining with an antibody in green to g and &E, which recognizes the human uh, form of g and &E when it's overexpressed. Uh, and as you can see, uh, there is not expression of either of those things in LEC3 cells, whereas in normal CHO cells, which are not mutated for g and &E, you can see uh, MAA staining along the membranes of all the cells because they make a normal level of sialic acid. If we transfect in a g and &E, wild type gene into those cells, we can now produce sialic acid on LEC3 cells, uh, and we can also see the transgenic human protein. And this is just a merged image on the left where we've also added in a blue stain for the nucleus called DAPI, just to visualize where the cells are. So, so gene, the gene replacement here can, can move you from having very little sialic acid to having uh, a lot of sialic acid. And so we then developed an ELISA plate assay, uh, which would allow us to um, screen 96 wells for sialic acid at a time. Uh, and we only put 10,000 cells into each one of those wells, and then we can infect them with different forms of AAV that contain the g and &E gene and test um, whether we get uh, sialic acid produced. 
And so here we're doing a colorimetric assay because the MAA is linked to horseradish peroxidase, which allows you to do a, uh, an enzymatic step that produces a color. And uh, then uh, in show cells, of course, there's a lot of MAA binding. In LEC3 cells, there's less. Uh, it's not exactly zero, but it's uh, very significantly reduced. Uh, and then if you infect different amounts of virus, there's my arrow here, um, you can um, titrate up and see the reintroduction of sialic acid in this assay. Um, Deborah Zygmunt uh, in my lab did this, this work, and one of the first things Deb discovered is that she needed to grow the LEC3 cells whoop, in um, serum-free media called Optimum in order um, to get the cells to have less sialic acid because serum actually contains a lot of sugar, and the sugar can feed the deficient cells sialic acid and NANAC and other things. Uh, which uh, complicates their, uh, the ability to see a difference here. And so if you starve them for serum, you can get this sort of effect, and then you can add back the virus to see uh, how much you've corrected that loss. Uh, so we also wanted to do an in vivo uh, experiment in mice so that we could see how much g &E we would need to introduce to recover uh, gene activity. Of course, GE is lethal as a, a, a mutation in the mouse, uh, so you can't make mice that are missing all of their GE. Uh, we're trying to fix that problem now, but that's again a story for another day. Uh, but you can overexpress GE in wild type mice and see a level of overexpression, uh, even though there's GE there to begin with, by looking at enzyme activity. Uh, so if you look at total sialic acid, you actually can't do that because when GE is overexpressed, it makes CMP a sialic acid. That actually feeds back by binding to GE and puts a break on that process uh, as what we call a negative feedback so that the GE becomes less functional so that it doesn't overproduce uh, sialic acid when you overexpress it. There are actually mutations in that binding region for CMP sialic acid that block that, that lead to a disease called sialuria, uh, where you make too much sialic acid. Uh, and so that's um, probably why that break evolved. But the first step in the process, epimerizing UDP gluconac to make MANNAC, um, is, is not subject to that regulation. And so we decided to use that as an enzyme assay to see if we could see overexpression of the gene in animals. And so to do this, we used a colorimetric assay. This is just a chemical method to put a color uh, compound onto MANNAC uh, called the Morgan-Elson reaction. And this is just a standard curve to show that we can see increasing amounts of MANNAC when we uh, do this chemical reaction. And so we can uh, then measure how much uh, MANNAC is in the cell uh, using this standard curve. Um, there are some uh, caveats here that uh, Deb discovered. Uh, also, this is Patricia Lamb, who's a, a senior scientist in the lab, also worked on this. Um, that uh, actually, she did most of this work. Uh, that uh, if you use small amounts of MANNAC, you can get these very linear curves. If you go up to higher concentrations of MANNAC, um, the curve becomes less linear. So that's why we chose to work in this concentration range for these sorts of assays. And if you do this in cells, again, show cells have g &E activity, and you can see that as primarized activity here. The LEC3 cells do not, and so that level is reduced about tenfold. And then if you introduce uh, g and &E, uh, AAV vectors into those cells, you can see overexpression of enzyme activity and you can see uh, that it has about, this has about three times the activity of the cells uh, that weren't overexpressing. And so you can see that overexpression and you can also see the correction of the enzyme activity from the LEC3 cells that didn't have it. And so when we did this in mice, uh, this is an experiment where we injected a fairly modest amount of AAV 
intravenously into an adult C57 black six wild type mouse. And then we took the gastrocnemius muscle out one month later. And uh, then we looked at whether the injected animals have more uh, enzyme activity than the uninjected animals. And uh, there was a big caveat here, which is that female mice turns out have more enzyme activity in this uh, muscle than male mice. And so you have to break them out by gender. Uh, this is probably just something that's a little weird about mice. Uh, so uh, we'll have to do more work to sort of figure that out. But uh, obviously if males and females have different amounts of activity, you can't really merge them together. And so you have to break them out by gender. And then the female injected mice showed a significant increase in activity relative to the uninjected mice and the male mice did as well. So even by getting just one out of every 10 nuclei in the muscle in a mouse injected with this AAV treatment, we're seeing a significant increase in enzyme activity over the whole of the muscle. Uh, and it's important to remember that muscles are syncytia of many hundreds of nuclei. So every muscle cell is made out of uh, hundreds of myoblasts that fuse together. That single cell then has many nuclei. And even if you infect less than every one of those, you can get uh, biological effects. And so it's important to, to uh, assess this uh, in, in the animal for that reason as well, because obviously cells in culture uh, don't behave the same way. So I'm just gonna talk for a few minutes about some new technologies that we're developing. And uh, by way of introduction, I'll remind you of some clinical data from the phase three ultragenics trial uh, that was published by Hans Lockmuller and colleagues uh, last year. Uh, and so in this trial, uh, slow release sialic acid was given to patients or placebo. And you can see here in part A, there's an upper extremity score and part B, a lower extremity score. In part C, a key secondary endpoint, which is the knee extensor. And, and you know, there's not a difference between treatment and placebo that's significant, uh, but the more important thing for us is to see just how slowly uh, and variably uh, patients are changing over time. Uh, and so when you're thinking about gene replacement, where all you're going to accomplish most likely is to stop the disease from progressing, it's going to be hard, actually I'd say impossible, to see a change, for example, in the knee extensor over this 48 week period uh, because it's not going down to begin with. Uh, and so, I mean, obviously some of these composite scores are, but it might still be hard to see a change. Uh, and so, bisistronic therapies, uh, bis bisistron, two genes, uh, are designed to not only do gene replacement, which would stop the disease, but also to build muscle growth, which should actually make the, the trend go in the opposite direction uh, from the disease. So at its best, single gene replacement probably will stop the disease from progressing, uh, but it's not gonna reverse it. Uh, although there are some examples uh, in the Duchenne trials where skills are actually acquired by single gene replacement. Um, so the idea of bisistronic therapy is that you would merge that potential for uh, stopping the disease with a second potential gene that would build new muscle uh, and actually increase strength. Um, this therapy, this sort of approach might be of greater benefit to patients and it might be able to have a much more significant impact on patients that already have a severe disease. And uh, most exciting for us also is that this is a platform capability that can be applied to many different um, genetic disorders. And so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how we played around with uh, fitting a second gene in, but the main gene that we worked on here was folostatin. Folostatin is an inhibitor of myostatin, which is a negative regulator of muscle growth. 
And because g and &E is a fairly sizable gene and folostatin is as well, we had to sort of play around with how to get those genes to fit into the inside of an AAV because there's a limited amount of DNA that you can put into the viral capsid. Uh, folostatin is also very attractive to us because it has already been tested in patients in clinical trials of patients with Becker muscular dystrophy and also patients with inclusion body myositis. Uh, these were clinical trials done by Jerry Mandel here at Nationwide Children's. And in both of those trials, he was able to show increased muscle size at a cellular level, and even in some examples of increased muscle function and strength. Um, so, uh, and certainly a safety. Uh, so we're attracted to this because if you're gonna put two genes together, it certainly doesn't hurt to have one of them already having been tested in, in patients. So myostatin has been known to be a regulator of muscle growth for a long time. Cattle farmers knew, knew about how to breed uh, cows to become extra beefy for a long time. And it turns out that they carry a mutation in one of their two copies of myostatin that knocks out its function. And so this gene was cloned by C. Jen Lee. And, and when Kathy Wagner and, and Dr. Lee uh, knocked this gene out in mice, you went from having this normal forelimb here uh, to um, having this massive amount of increase in muscle mass. There are actually patients uh, that have these mutations as well. Uh, it's not unsafe to have this amount of muscle, uh, but it is um, extremely unusual to be able to have it without doing any exercise. Uh, so we started out by making these bisestronic vectors where the second gene was green fluorescent protein, and we used an internal ribosomal entry site to allow for a single mRNA to produce two different proteins. So uh, G and E is made from this first ribosome entry site over here, and then there's a second site that sits down on the RNA and makes the second gene. As you can see here in uh, transfected cells, the, if we stain for G and E in red, in GFP and green, uh, you can make both of these proteins in cells that are transfected. This is a fax analysis of, of a number of different constructs that we tried out. Uh, and again, uh, some of these uh, are trying to get rid of pieces of DNA to see if we can fit uh, G and E and folostatin together. But we started out with GFP just as a reporter to do these experiments. And so Psi5 here is staining for G and E protein, and GFP is staining for that second uh, gene in, this, in the bisestron. It's not staining, it's spontaneously fluorescing. Um, so uh, as you can see, we can express both G and E and GFP quite well. If we change the size of the iris to make it smaller, we still make the GNE, but the GFP is less well expressed. If we start messing around with the promoter to make it smaller, but keep the iris the same, uh, now both genes actually, both proteins are, are less well expressed. So this was very frustrating. We spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to um, make these DNAs smaller so that they could be packaged together with larger second genes for GNE. And, and most of those were unsuccessful. Um, and uh, this is just an example of a Western blot showing the same thing, where um, here we've injected G &E, uh, gene therapy into a muscle. And you can see this green band here is G &E protein. Uh, the red protein down here is GAPDH, which is an internal control to show that you loaded the same amount of protein in every lane. And then when you miniaturize, um, aspects of the gene, like in this case, the iris, you can still make G and E, uh, but it's less well expressed. And, uh, and uh, likewise, you have uh, problems with the second gene as well. Uh, some of these antibodies to G and E actually uh, bind to background proteins that aren't G and E. And in this case, it even binds to uh, folostatin, which is a little uh, troubling. Uh, but, but we did find one antibody that seemed to work for this sort of experiment. So the good news is that, uh, so we just went back and said, okay, well, let's just try to make these bisestronic vectors with the full-length iris. 
even though we're over the 4,700 base pair packaging limit of G&E. And uh, the good news is that we were able to get a yield from that virus uh, prep that was as good as when we miniaturized it. Um, and so uh, sometimes you just get lucky and you can pack a little more DNA into AAV than you um, might have with other constructs. Uh, and in this case, um, we were successful in getting these two genes together uh, in a high yield uh, that could be um, developed for um, further studies. And so this platform of bisestronic therapy is actually applicable to over 30 neuromuscular disorders. And for gene &E myopathy, uh, we've made four different constructs now where the second muscle growth gene is either folostatin or insulin-like growth factor one. Uh, both of these genes are known to build new muscle growth. Uh, and then uh, we've either used a constitutive promoter, which is this cytomegalovirus promoter, or a muscle-specific promoter, which is a version of muscle creatine kinase promoter. Um, and so I'm going to spend, I have it as 12.41. I have four minutes, I guess. Um, so I'm going to spend the last four minutes talking about some work that Kelly Crow did when she was a graduate student in the lab uh, to ask about this question of which promoter would be better, a constitutive promoter or a muscle-specific promoter. Uh, and I'll just um, share four pieces of data um, from her studies that lead us to think that using a constitutive promoter where you express g and &E in all the cells of the body would be beneficial uh, for therapy g and &E, of course, is expressed in all cells of the body, and so there, there wouldn't be anything wrong with doing that. Although, obviously, as a muscle-specific disease, the, there's sort of an intuitive logic to suggesting that you should only express it in muscle to fix that problem. Uh, and so for this set of studies that Kelly did, um, we were very, very um, fortunate to be able to receive uh, a GNE transgenic model from the Nishino Noguchi groups in Japan. They were extremely generous to share uh, their mice with us and mail them all the way from Japan to Columbus. Um, and uh, these mice bear a human uh, mutation in the human GNE gene as a transgene uh, that is expressed in mice that are deficient for their own uh, endogenous GNE gene expression. So all the normal gene expression in the mouse is removed, and only the mutant uh, human expression is, is present. And what Kelly did was to compare liver and muscle-specific promoters using intraperitoneal or intramuscular injection to look at just how much sialic acid um, does each organ make and how much of that um, goes to the muscle. Um, so I'm going to just share one set of results from her many, many results in, in, in this talk. But this is just to show you that the liver-specific promoter here, LSP, overexpresses the GE &E gene in the liver, whereas the muscle-specific promoter does not. If you look in muscle, which is part B here, it's just the opposite, where the muscle-specific promoter expresses in these two muscles, the gastric mumeus and the tibialis anterior and the liver-specific promoter um, does not. So that just tells you that, that they're expressing only in the organs that we want them to express in. So we can do the experiment of asking the question about um, what happens. Uh, there's a flag tag put onto the GNE protein. And again, if you express it with a muscle-specific promoter in muscle, you can see recombinant protein being expressed, but not, when you, uh, not in the liver. And if you use a liver-specific promoter, you can see recombinant protein being expressed in the liver, but not in the muscle. If we stain for sialic acid with uh, SNA, which is a lectin, a plant lectin that binds alpha 2 6 linked sialic acid, and we also stain with PNA, which is a lectin that binds to uh, a sugar called gal beta 1 3 galnac but that uh, only binds when sialic acid isn't present. You can see that in uh, liver, there's a low levels of sialic acid and high levels of unsialylated uh, sugar. Uh, if you overexpress the muscle-specific uh, promoter, uh, that doesn't change. And if you overexpress with the liver-specific promoter, you now have a lot more sialic acid made in the liver. 
and less uh, of the A-glyco, a cyalo form. But if we stain prosialic acid in muscle, we see a different story, which is that in uninjected muscle, you have this sort of low level of sialic acid present. You overexpress with a muscle-specific promoter, you have uh, increased sialic acid around all of the fibers of the muscle, this sort of honeycomb pattern. Each one of these is a muscle cell. Uh, and this is a, an experiment where we looked uh, over a course of 10 months. So this is a very long experiment. Uh, but if you use a liver-specific promoter, now the, the GE is being expressed in the liver, but those proteins, which are getting into the serum, are then getting back into the muscle to deliver sialic acid to the muscle. There's actually more sialic acid from the liver specific promoter over 10 months than there is from the muscle specific promoter. Of course, it over, over expresses in the liver as well. And so, what we take this to mean is that um, there's more than one organ that's contributing sialic acid to the muscle. And we've seen this in a number of other studies as well with other models uh, where liver is contributing to heart and muscle sialic acid in the extracellular matrix. Uh, and that that should not be ignored when designing gene therapies uh, for this disease. Um, so key takeaways, um, gene therapy, I hope I've impressed upon you that it has enormous potential to treat this disease, uh, just as it's been showing enormous potential to treat other muscle diseases. Um, and that a number of um, uh, new gene therapies uh, uh, are being developed, and that uh, some of these will have multiple functions, which should have, in theory, uh, a greater impact on the disease. Uh, so what we have tried to do so far is build tools that we can use to um, study the potency of GNE, both in animals and also in cells, to try to make better versions of, of these gene therapies that work with smaller amounts of material. And um, we will try to optimize those assays and also characterize uh, new second generation gene therapy vectors with the hope that we can choose uh, the best one of those uh, to bring to patients in a clinical trial eventually. Uh, so I have to have a few thank yous here. Uh, so all of the cell line work was done by Deborah Zygmunt in my lab. She is uh, right over here in the middle next to me. Uh, and Kelly Crow uh, did the work on promoter uh, function. And she is uh, in the back here on the left. And then Patricia Lamb, who's not in the picture, uh, has uh, pioneered the development of the bisystronic vectors and also uh, has performed the majority of the in, in vivo uh, potency assays in mice. Uh, we're very grateful to the Neuromuscular Disease Foundation for the opportunity to do some of this work. Uh, the bisystronic uh, gene therapy technologies are funded by an internal grant from Nationwide Children's Hospital and also the state of Ohio. Uh, we also um, use funds for some of this work that are from the Center for Research Translation and Muscular Dystrophy Therapeutic Development, which is an NIH grant. And the, the, the biodistribution studies I showed you were funded by Parent Project Muscular Dystrophy, uh, in, uh, who were very, very generous to give us a grant to develop a toxicology study for the GALGT2 gene therapy. I have a lot of collaborators at Nationwide Children's and Ohio State uh, that help with this work. Uh, and a huge clinical team of people uh, that deal with everything from patient care to physical therapy to FDA technology, uh, FDA regulatory issues to clinical trial ma management uh, to technology uh, development and, and, and the like. So that is, that is it for me. I'm happy to answer any questions and I hope you found this useful. Uh, thanks very much for listening. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Martin. That was incredibly informative. And I'm going to turn this over uh, in a moment to, to Nuria Carrillo. But first, I want to 
uh, let everyone know that Nuria will be making her own presentation, a sort of an amalgamation of everything that we're doing and uh, the future of gene therapy and where we still need to go uh, on September 25th. So please put that on your calendar. And then before I let Nuria ask the questions, I'm going to do something cheeky and jump the line and ask my own question. And it's sort of asking basically, as so many patients call me on the regular basis and ask, well, what's the delay? Why is it taking so long to get gene therapy going? Why didn't you do this years ago? And of course, um, you know, there's the, the, the recent uh, tragedies that occurred at Audentis is something that we can't forget, you know, or you know, I know that dosing is a huge part of that. But I wanted you to specifically address the challenges of treating an adult versus the children, or for instance, the eye that you mentioned from Sparks Therapeutic is such a small area. Could you, for the sake of people who think we're taking too long and being too cautious, could you please address the challenges with regards to that? And having said that, I'm going to go off camera and let Nuria take it from there, but I'll be listening with great interest. Thank you. No, it's, it, uh, you absolutely hit the nail on the head. Uh, so in the phase three, ultragenic study, I think the average weight of patients was about 70 kilograms. So that's 70 times the dose I was talking about there, which is 100 trillion viruses per kilogram, so 70 times that. Um, so that is, a, and in terms of manufacturing, in terms of proof of safety, uh, that's just a much higher bar than it is in a six-month-old child or in the case of our Duchenne trial, you know, a, a seven-year-old child, for example. Um, so um, that puts an increased onus on investigators to prove safety, and it also puts an increased onus on investigators to make sure that uh, the gene can be manufactured in the amounts that it needs to be manufactured uh, to give it to patients. Um, so Zolgensma uh, is, you know, being sold for SMA gene therapy, I believe, for something on the order of $2 million a dose, uh, uh, and that's in children. So, you know, the, there's a number of factors here, price, manufacturing, safety, that need to be addressed in order for uh, adults to be treated with, with, with this technology. Um, so, and that, that's not to say that it can't be done. But um, I don't think we're in an immediate position to do it right away uh, without understanding some more about um, these issues of potency and optimization and also um, perhaps getting some increased um, abilities in manufacturing. Okay, so as Lala mentioned, I'm Nuria Carrillo and I will be coordinating the questions and answers for today. And I have received some of the questions from the chat. I'm going to start with a question of my own. Uh, Paul, gene therapy provides hope for the treatment of uh, gene myopathy, and your program is developing tools that are getting us closer to that. Uh, also, your institution at Nationwide Children's has an excellent track record of developing gene therapy for rare diseases, including muscle diseases. Can you tell us, from your point of view, what are the most important things that scientists need to show before a gene therapy clinical trial for GNE myopathy is allowed to start by the FDA? And in light of that, what are your next steps uh, and what are the main challenges that lie ahead? Well, I think it's, it's always, um... I have a set of things in my mind that I often think about. Uh, I try not to think second guess what the FDA will ask for. Uh, the fortunate thing is, is you can go ask them if what you're thinking is true, is, is, uh, is what they're thinking or not. You know, there's a lot of ways to interact with the FDA to make sure that you're doing the right experiments and doing the things that they think you need to do to get something approved. Uh, but I think that um, a number of uh, a number of things that I'm thinking about are uh, deal with animal models. Uh, how uh, is there a, an animal model of GNE myopathy that would be sufficiently robust to prove that therapies work? 
uh, and you know, uh, there are some models available now. Uh, but we are actually trying to develop a more severe model so that um, we can test therapies more quickly. Uh, and then uh, I think uh, the other, uh, you know, there, there's, it's just a multifaceted uh, set of questions uh, that require a large team of individuals to answer. So you need clinical trialists and clinicians that understand the disease in patients and how to design a trial that you can uh, show that you know where, that, that the intervention has worked, and that that's a that's a huge thing, and that's not you know I'm not a physician, so I don't I rely on others to help me with that. Um, and then um, there's the issue of manufacturing. Uh, can we produce enough of the virus uh, to treat all of the patients that are going to need it? And then I think one of the big things that I also I think is important to address is the exist uh, the question of uh, pre-existing immunity. So uh, AAV is a naturally occurring virus in humans, uh, and so uh, if you're making antibodies to it, it's it's a little easier to make antibodies than to COVID. <laughs> uh, you know, so we some people have antibodies to this virus already. Uh, they didn't get sick from it. Uh, they didn't even know they had it probably. Uh, but uh, we want to treat all of the patients, and so we need to come up with methods uh, to remove those antibodies prior to treatment to get the best possible outcome for that patient. So all of these things are the things that I'd say are, are the most important things to work on. I appreciate what you said, especially the part about that, you know, developing um, a drug or a gene therapy for a rare disease is a team effort. And I think one of the goals that NDF has is to bring together experts from many different disciplines that can look at uh, and take a multidisciplinary approach to tackle um, and, and bring uh, the hope of, of developing gene therapy in DNA myopathy. And I think that Lale has done a great job of that. Um, I'm gonna now continue with uh, questions from some of our viewers. Uh, this is from um, the first one. What is the time frame to see improvement once gene therapy is injected into the body? Well, I can tell you for Duchenne, it can be as quick as three months. Uh, so it, most gene therapies, because the it's a single strand of DNA. Uh, a second strand has to be synthesized and then uh, gene expression has to be turned on. So generally speaking, the first two or three weeks after a gene therapy is given, there's absolutely no expectation of a clinical change because the gene hasn't even been expressed yet. But once uh, you get to three or four weeks, that gene is now on and able to do its job. And then it really just depends on um, uh, what you're looking for. But uh, if, the, if it's a question of fixing the muscle, uh, then, you know, there's a perhaps would be a time lag uh, there as well, or getting enough sialic acid uh, onto the muscle to have it function in a more normal way. Uh, but uh, in other diseases, months, the big changes have been seen in months. Uh, in other, uh, so, it's 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 an impossible question to answer at this point, but uh, it could be uh, in a matter of months uh, that you would see some significant changes. Is this something that uh, you could potentially get an idea when you do the experiments in the mouse model, so that that can uh, guide the design of a clinical trial? Uh, yes, yes. Um, I will tell you though that. Humans and mice are quite different. <laughs> they walk on four limbs, <laughs> not two. Um, and so they are actually, I think, much, uh, uh, because, because of that alone, they're, they're more able to deal with muscle dysfunction than, than humans. Um, so uh, uh, certainly they can be a very important tool to understanding uh, that aspect of, of the kinetics of disease and when uh, we would expect to see changes. 
Thank you. Um, another question for one of our viewers is Lipoplex has been used before on patients with DNA myopathy. Uh, from your point of view, is this a viable uh, treatment option? So, so I, I hope that I didn't let people believe that AAV would be the only approach to gene therapy. There are certainly many different technologies, including uh, use of uh, naked DNA or an uncapsulated DNA like lipoplex uh, technology. In my experience, those technologies are much more difficult uh, because viruses know how to get into cells and they're very clever. <laughs> and so we've harnessed that cleverness uh, to uh, give more efficient gene transfer. Um, but uh, there will be new technologies and some of those might not involve viruses at all uh, that involve uh, both gene editing and also um, putting larger pieces of, of foreign DNA into cells. Uh, that will come along in, in due time, yes. Um, so I, I can't say that I, uh, I don't want to disparage any other method. Yeah. That makes sense. Uh, I love this question from Imad Kassim. He says, for the different types of gene therapies discussed, is the delivery focused on specific muscle groups or is it delivered in the blood systemically, so it's brought over to all muscle tissues in the body. And I know that you made a comment for that. And then he finishes the question by saying, for example, when Popeye eats spinach, he ends up growing his bicep. But when Hulk develops rage, he grows muscles all over <laughs> his body. So, yeah, what so, so the way, uh, you know, uh, I, I think you would express it everywhere. Uh, we would do intravenous treatments. Uh, when we started out in gene therapy, it was a fairly new technology and there were a lot of concerns about safety. And so oftentimes when studies were done, and microdystrophin is a great example, uh, a single muscle would be injected as the first trial and then, uh, and then a whole limb and then uh, only then some time later for a whole patient's treated. Uh, I think enough trials have gone on now with whole patient treatment, just intravenous injection in the arm. Uh, that that those sort of preliminary studies would no longer be needed. Um, so uh, we would imagine just going straight to treating the whole patient and every muscle uh, that we could. Okay. Um, I hope that answered the question, Imad. Um, from a different viewer, Tammy Hardman, she says, realistically, when is the earliest that bisistronic gene therapy would be available for GNE myopathy patients? And she thanks you for your presentation. Um, well, thank you for listening. I, I, I'm not going to posit a guess there. Uh, I can say that uh, we are in what we would call the preclinical testing stage right now. Uh, after that is finished, there has to be. Um, preclinical toxicology studies that are done, and those are typically done by outside companies at fairly high expense. Uh, and then uh, one would apply for an IND to go to trial. Um, so I, I, can't, I can't give you a timetable on that. Um, all I can say is we're trying as hard as we can to move as fast as we can. Um, a question regarding uh, from Mrs. Vogel regarding uh, gene therapy treating all mutations or just uh, pathogenic variants in either the polymerase or the kinase domains. Uh, she's heard some conflicting information about whether gene therapy would treat all or just some. Can you uh, provide uh, your point of view on what your strategy is attempting to do in terms of this? Yeah. So so. What we're going to, what we're doing is putting a, a normal copy of the unmutated copy of the gene into all of the cells of the body. So in theory, that should compensate for any gene mutation found in gene myopathy. So it would treat all of the patients uh, with a single treatment. Where it gets confusing, and I think sometimes uh, non-scientists or lay people 
uh, get confused is when we talk about gene editing, where you're using Cas9 CRISPR type technologies to fix a gene mutation in your actual genome. Uh, there you're actually changing a single mutation. And so if you develop that technology, that will fix one kind of mutation, but not others. Um, this is different. We're just adding the normal gene back to all of the cells. And so it should work uh, for all the mutations that are uh, present in patients. And I can give an example. I think some uh, people on the line may have heard used before when you're doing gene therapy in the strategy that Dr. Martin is using, uh, you are delivering a brand new book containing all the information on GNE to the cells so that they can read that book and make the, the, the result, uh, which is the enzyme that it's in the thialic acid biosynthesis pathway. So delivering a whole book, brand new book, that's gene therapy versus gene editing which is the other strategy in which you just go into the book and correct a single spelling mistake. In that case, that would only apply for those patients that have that specific spelling mistake. Uh, but like he mentioned, gene therapy is amenable to all different uh, changes and mutations because you are providing a brand new book. Is that a good way to put it, Paul? I think that's an excellent, uh, I'm going to use that now too. <laughs> yes. Um, next question uh, from Mangesh. He says, compared to Duchenne or other neuromuscular diseases, is there, are there any particular challenges uh, specific for GNE myopathy to get to a gene therapy uh, treatment or trial? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think the major challenge is that by and large, GNE myopathy is an adult onset disease. Uh, and I'm saying that as a pediatric sort of person. So adult for me is, you know, past 12. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so the size of the patient is going to be larger. Um, and that is a very significant challenge for manufacturing and also um, for optimization of the treatment. Um, but otherwise, no. Um, in fact, uh, I think in some ways, um, as a myopathy without a major inflammatory component, uh, which Duchenne has, um, the gene therapy might be uh, more powerful uh, than it would be when you're going into an inflamed muscle where there's a lot of immune cells already primed to, to deal with uh, getting rid of the viral capsid. And you already mentioned this, um, but Paul, but um, of course, uh, gene therapy as opposed to Duchenne uh, will be given to adults. And you have shown in a publication that of the patients that you tested with GNE myopathy, I, th I, be I believe it was roughly half of them had antibodies against viral vectors. Um, do you envision that to be an issue once you get to clinical trials? And are there any strategies uh, that other gene therapy trials are using to overcome that challenge? And just to put it in terms, basically, if your body during your lifetime has seen the virus from an infection that it's typically asymptomatic, your, your body would develop antibodies against that virus because it's uh, detected as strange. So when you're using that same virus to put your new book to deliver it to the cells and your body recognizes it, the body doesn't differentiate whether it's actually for your own therapy or an invasion. So it attacks it and it prevents it from actually getting into the cells where it would have the, the treatment. And, and this is a problem, uh, I guess, across uh, gene therapy strategies that use AAV and uh, and, and I know there are some strategies that have been developed, Paul, and you probably are much more familiar with them. So, so yes, um, there are ways, there are drugs uh, that can be given to suppress uh, the production of antibodies. There are also methods to clean antibodies out of uh, the serum of patients, uh, like plasmapheresis. 
And there are a lot of new technologies that are being developed to make that sort of approach even more effective. Uh, so it's possible that in order to treat every patient, we might have to use some sort of immunosuppression method, and that would only have to be happen until you know, prior to the time of treatment for a small period of time. Once the treatment is given, that would no longer be required. But once the gene therapy goes into the cells, the antibodies no longer uh, are an issue uh, for the genes already delivered. The, the antibody is not going to block that delivery uh, anymore. So uh, yes, there will have to be some thought given to that. And uh, that, um, but I'm very optimistic that there will be strategies that can work for that. Uh, to get that problem out of the way. And you are able to test their, what, which patients may have antibodies or not, even before dosing them, correct? Oh, yes, we have to do that. And we have a FDA approved uh, lab here to test for antibody levels uh, prior, to, prior to treatment. And uh, then we follow actually the production of antibodies because once the virus is given, they're effect effectively patients are immunized against that viral capsid and they produce more antibodies because we've given them uh, the viral protein. Uh, that's not a problem for them in terms of their health, uh, but we follow that just to uh, monitor it uh, once the treatment is given. So yes. Um, I don't know, Lali, we have time for more questions. We have a couple more. We have as much time as you guys need, and um, unless Dr. Martin has to run, uh, we encourage everybody to answer, to get all of their questions answered. And I think there's only a couple more, right? Yeah. Yeah, I so have time. Follow -up. Sorry, go ahead. So there's a follow-up question uh, regarding the bisistronic gene therapy, whether it makes sense to pursue both single gene therapy and the bisistronic gene therapy or focused all energy just on the bisistronic gene therapy? What What is your um, thoughts on that? I always like to play it safe. <laughs> so I would say, I would, I would suggest we work on both at the same time, uh, unless there can be a incredibly strong rationale made for the fact that perhaps the single gene alone could not be shown to work. If that were the case, then there would be a very strong rationale to do just the, the second uh, approach. Um, but I do believe that um, it's always better to be safe than sorry. And so I, I would suggest, uh, and our plan is to develop and work on both of those strategies uh, at the same time. So um, were there be, are there current clinical trials that are being carried with bisistronic therapy and no. have there been any safety differences between just single gene versus bisistronic? Um, there, you know, so for uh, lysosomal storage disorder, there's a bi gene therapy uh, with two promoters. Um, so that's bisistronic. Uh, uh, the, yeah, so, I mean, there are a few. Uh, but uh, this would be a fairly new new idea in the field. Um, so in terms of safety, I mean, I think uh, the safety tests will be the same. Obviously, the molecular tests will double. We'll have to you know, show uh, functional changes and gene expression changes for two genes instead of one uh, and two proteins instead of one. But um, uh, otherwise, I, you know, it's a single product, uh, and so the safety tests should be um, the following the safety protocols in terms of testing should be the same. Okay, and I actually have a question regarding the safety um, and what we have seen um, with the recent news of the trial. What do you think? Uh, it's causing in the patients that received high dos doses to have these uh, severe complications. What is it? Is well, the exact mechanism of what's happening it known? I, no, I don't think I don't think that anybody can say that. Obviously, it's being intensely investigated. 
Uh, I will say that patients with X-linked myotubular myopathy can have pre-existing liver conditions uh, as part of their disease. And so it's possible, although I don't know this for a fact at all, that those patients were predisposed to liver issues because of their disease rather than because of the higher dose of gene therapy. And because the number of patients being treated in these trials is very small, it's entirely possible that these safety issues were random and unrelated to dose as well. Uh, although there's a lot of anecdotal evidence and some direct evidence that viral capsid overload in the liver can cause disease in animal models. So, I mean, it seems pretty clear that that's a possibility as well. Um, so it's possible that this patient group is particularly susceptible to that issue. It's also possible that manufacturing uh, was an issue. Uh, I can't speak to that at all. I don't know anything about that uh, in terms of that trial. Uh, but there are a number of issues that will have to be explored to understand what happened with those patients. Okay. Secondary, genetic, secondary genetic issues in patients unrelated to disease could also be a factor. Um, and, and, and in terms of continuing with safety, what is the current uh, position um, among scientists about the AAV viral integration and genotoxicity, and what is typically required in terms of showing in preclinical models before moving to clinical trials. And what I'm trying to describe for the viewers is um, when you deliver a gene, um, there had been in the literature some studies showing that that gene may insert itself in the in the genome of a of a mouse, and that that would increase the risk, what people call genotoxicity, so toxicity caused just by genetic therapies, and that was the source of a lot of focus from the FDA. Um, and I know that uh, there's been a lot of research going on, and I was just wondering where do we stand with that? Is that something that uh, we should be worried about that you need to monitor, or is that no longer an issue that that or had it been resolved? Oh, I mean, I so if you're injecting a hundred trillion viral particles into uh, an animal or a patient, uh, a small fraction of those will integrate into the genome, and in, a, in an organ like the liver that could end up being a fairly significant number of cells. So Doug McCarty has done the best, some of the most elegant work on this to look at viral integration. Um, but you know there are many, many trials ongoing and there's not a single report of that causing a problem in a patient, for example, a cancer or something like that. And so uh, if it is a risk, it seems to be a theoretical risk to me uh, and one that would be very minor compared to the severity of the diseases that are being treated. Um, so um, time may change that opinion, but uh, generally speaking, you know, the genome is very large. And so one or two integration events in a cell or two here and there that generally are going to be accommodated with uh, no problem at all. But these are also very small pieces of DNA, uh, which also is not so, uh, not, not so bad. Um, so uh, I don't think that um, people have different opinions about whether this is a big problem. Uh, but I think if you just look at the clinical trials that have been done up to this point, and the fact that there have been no genotoxicity issues reported that have led to uh, a sec a, 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 an adverse outcome like a cancer, uh, I think that's, that's how I look at it. That it does, doesn't seem to be a factor. Well, basically, uh, it's a very low chance um, of happening, and you know that out. You know that what you're treating outweighs the potential risks. Um, that's what you're saying. I have yes. another question, um, follow up from Mrs. Hartman, uh, saying that her son was diagnosed at 13, and now he's 16 with symptoms. 
uh, he, she says maybe he would be a good candidate eventually. I believe she said this in a follow-up as uh, uh, for the antibodies against AAV. Do we know, Paul, how how these antibodies, what the prevalence of these antibodies increase with age? And they do. Um, so because we work on Duchenne, which is a disease of children, we did a study where we looked at um, non-diseased children, diseased children, uh, non-diseased adults, diseased adults, and by and large, uh, as uh, the adults had uh, a higher chance of having antibodies uh, to the virus than did the children, uh, probably about a two-fold increase. Uh, so that uh, is, that's what I know about that. Uh, having said that, though, I'm, I, these technologies that are being developed to get rid of antibodies prior to treatment uh, may negate that as an issue eventually moving forward. Um, I don't see any more questions, but I encourage everyone that if you have a question to let us know, we have the expert with us now that can answer many of your questions with gene therapy. So I would encourage if anybody has any more questions uh, to let us know in the chat. Um, any final thoughts, Paul? Uh, what are the main challenges that you see moving ahead and uh, how would you like other researchers in gene myopathy to help in this collaborative effort of bringing gene therapy to clinical trials? I think that uh, the only thing I would suggest is that we all share everything we we make. So, I mean, uh, uh, we would like to make a model uh, where we can delete G&E entirely and inducibly uh, in the mouse. And uh, I know others are working on that as well. So I would just hope that whoever gets to that problem first and succeeds will just give those those mice to Jackson Labs or to NDF and uh, so that everybody can use them. Uh, uh, it's a little harder to share viruses because they're so expensive to make, <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, that would be another uh, important thing to probably do. Any more questions or something you would like to add, Lale? No, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Martin. That was, we're getting a ton of compliments. I'm getting them not only on this chat box, but on my text uh, via WhatsApp from, we've had viewers from Japan, India, Turkey, uh, the Europe, uh, the United Kingdom. So we really, really appreciate this. This has been um, uh, very much anticipated and very much appreciated. And if people do have questions, um, if you want to forward them to us at info at curehibm.org, we will forward them to Dr. Martin and he will answer them as he sees fit, perhaps. So thank you, uh, both of you, Nuria and Dr. Martin. And, and again, remember, our final date for this speaker series is September 25th when uh, Nuria will wrap it all up for us. So thank you again. And this recording will be posted as usual on our website, curatesibm.org. So we look forward to hearing from all of you soon. It's thank been you. a pleasure. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Have a great weekend, everyone.